You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. Okay, uh, we're uh, on the podcast, Something Rather Than Nothing, and... Uh... It is it is wonderful to have uh, Seamus Murphy, uh, photographer and director, uh, with us, and um, he's uh, had some in- incredible books which display uh, his images and photographs. Uh, one is called "The Darkness Visible: Afghanistan." Uh, also, another collaboration with Polly Jean Harvey called "The Hollow of the Hand: um, The Republic," uh, which covers uh, his homeland, uh, Ireland. And I am the beggar of the world with Eliza Griswold, and uh, which includes um, his images with some Landai uh, poetry. Uh, in addition to those uh, p- printed works, uh, he has films including uh, the videos uh, for Polly Jean Harvey's "Let England Shake," and uh, another uh, some other short films, um, and a more recent one called "A Dog Called Money." I wanted to uh, welcome you, Seamus, to the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question uh, I ask guests is, um, what were you like as a, as, a, as a young child? A monster. A monster. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I, was, uh, I, I guess I was an average kid. You know, I grew up in Dublin um, in the 60s, 70s. Um, and I think my I was I was one of six kids and uh, I was the youngest and uh, I think it was benign neglect I think they call it you know my parents were were very loving but um, they let us get on with things so uh, <laughs> it was it was it was it was uh, when I look back on 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 it it was it was glorious in many ways you know we were able to sort of you know we, we lived in 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 the city of Dublin and we were able to sort of be on the street and, and it wasn't. Uh, worrying too much about uh, the dangers that are out there now. And, um, you know, I played football a lot. Football was my thing. And, um, as a kid and, uh, no, I, 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 uh, yeah, I, I, how would I describe myself? I think just sort of, yeah, average little, little, what they call in Dublin, a little gurrier, which is, um, it comes from the French, uh, Guerre, you know, like uh, like war warrior. Right. Right. And, um, and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, it's not a good. It's not a good thing to say about somebody, but people people use it affectionately. So, little Dublin Gurrier, um, yeah. So, up did to you mis- up to mischief and that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> did you? Um, uh, did, did I mean, were you snapping photos at a young age? Were you drawing? Did no, you see yourself no, with an artistic I, I, bent? No, absolutely nothing whatsoever. I mean, I, I, you know, my 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 thing was football. I was I was a you know I was a football fanatic and. Um, all I sort of thought about was football and, and, uh, and it was physical, you know, you know, always, I remember, remember sort of, there used to be these shops near me and, and, um, you'd be sent to, to buy something in the shop and you're just running all the time. It was, you know, it was very physical, always running, running, running. That's what I remember as, 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 as a kid was running all the time. Um, everything, everywhere was, was, um, I never walked. I always ran, you know, and I think everyone around me was the same. It was the same way. It was an incredible energy. I just, uh, this is all pretty very rose tinted, and you know, looking back on your on your on your childhood, but um, I just seem to be running all the time. Very physical, you know, very very conscious of being healthy and fit, and um, didn't really have any artistic uh, bents. But I mean, you know, in Ireland, it's like everyone's talking and um, telling stories, and and I think it's almost an instinctive thing that we 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 there's an artistic vein in everyone, and and um, it comes out in different ways. So did you, you mentioned, you mentioned stories and you're a storyteller, um, you know, visually and, and in particular with the collected images in, in, in a film, um, is that something you picked up that, that entire time, the stories you heard and your connection to the, the environment and talking and conversation as, as a yeah, way to and drive reading. that? And, and reading. Oh, sorry. That's, that's a phone that normally never rings. And for some reason, <laughs> someone is, it's better, I bet it's a sales call or, you know, <laughs> or some, some ambulance chasing lawyer. Uh, it's it perfectly up. Sorry that. fine. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I you know, not consciously. I mean, I just think you know, we we, we know. I, I think you know, I I, came, I grew up in a generation of uh, in Ireland when um, art and anything like that was 
largely seen as probably being very pretentious and you know you you were you were very kind of uh, full of yourself if you called yourself an artist um and yet you know we all loved music we all loved to read um i just think it was le- we were less conscious of that kind of stuff you know we weren't um you know these days everyone's an artist and um we appreciate things far more and we got deeper deeper feelings for things um uh, or, at, or at least we tell ourselves that, but um, not consciously. No, no, not consciously. But an, an artist. Well, but but now you are. So why why do you why why do you feel that you create now? I mean, did did it was all of a sudden there, there was a drive to capture what you were seeing, what you were hearing? I think in school, you know, writing probably from a, you know early teens, I, I discovered that I I really enjoyed writing and I really. I really, I did quite well at it. In fact, probably, probably one of the only subjects I did well in was was English, you know, and 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 you know, English literature and and writing, and essay writing. So, I guess that was the beginning of 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 understanding that um, you know, uh, expressing yourself uh, beyond just telling stories and playing football and doing doing the kind of, you know, the um, the prosaic stuff of of uh, of uh, an Irish childhood. Um, yeah, not not consciously so, but anyway, yeah, English, English, and reading and books, and uh, and I wanted to become a journalist. I think that that then was the thing that that, that drove me, you know, as as I was, you know, heading towards leaving school and what, what I was going to do with 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 either studying or education. Um, I thought about becoming a journalist, and I, I tried to get into the journalism school in Dublin, and I didn't get in because I think someone told me that well. You know, you, you're supposed to have had written stuff for a local newspaper, and um, even if it meant going to a football match and, and taking down the scores, you know. And parents, I, I guess, that were pushy and, and understood this were, were encouraging the kids to do that. Mine didn't. Um, they kind of let it, let us get on with things. And I did get into the journalism college, but I got into something pretty far more interesting, which was the first communications course that was set up in Dublin. And by doing that, I got introduced to cameras. Um, and radio, and um, it was a very general course, but it opened up a world that I didn't really, um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't aware of before, uh, which was the camera and um, using the camera for that kind of stuff. I found myself after college in America, and I lived for a while in, in San Francisco, and there was a there was a there was a public darkroom down the street from where I was living, I, and I I I went and, and sort of joined up there and started printing my, my pictures. And I think that's where it really took off, you know, where, where you could take a photograph, uh, do, you know, shoot a roll of film and then go and print it and, and see the results. And I learned so much from that. And um, so that was that was how I, I got introduced to cameras. And what um, in, in so you take you take your camera. I mean, you've You've traveled, um, you know, for for the listeners. I mean, you've traveled to a lot of um, a lot of locations around the world, including, um, you know, those in in conflict in in war. Um, and when when you've done that, are you trying to are you trying to capture what you see? Are you trying to document or? Yes, what are you trying in, in, to express? Yes, I mean it's certainly initially. You know, when I when I started doing that work, which was, um, you know, I was interested in journalism. I was never attracted to war or war reporting. It wasn't. It wasn't something that, you know, um, I, I was. I was particularly uh, motivated. You know, to to get into get, to get into journalism and become a photographer. With, you know, that came later. Um, but I, I started learning the craft, and and eventually I started getting work and and. Um, getting some newspaper work in, in London. I was living in London at the time. And um, I guess I was beginning to sort of, yes, I was beginning to sort of, you know, read reports of stuff happening in other places. And Afghanistan was somewhere that my eldest sister had been to on, on the hippie trail, you know, and she used to say that actually Afghanistan, of all the places that she went to, was the most fascinating and the most unexpected. And, you know, I just heard all these amazing stories about this country. And, of course, there was this, you know, after she'd been there, there'd been the you know the, the Soviet invasion and all the things you know, all the stories that happened, all the stuff that happened to to Afghanistan became a particularly interesting place. And I had the opportunity to go there in '94, and you know that was my baptism of fire when it came to conflict. Suddenly, I was actually the year before I'd been to Eritrea. The war wasn't the war was over, but there was a referendum. But I 
I spent a month there and it was a very interesting time because they'd been, they'd had 30 years of war, Eritrea and Ethiopia. And right. it was a country post-conflict. And I, I was suddenly understanding, my God, you know, you know, when a war goes on, these things happen. And then you start realizing all the consequences and talking to people about their experiences and, you know, seeing people walking around with, with, um, you know, limbless and, 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 uh, you know, being introduced to concepts like landmines and, you know, you know, people standing on mines. And, you know, it was a whole world that I hadn't really hadn't really given a lot of thought to. And uh, the idea that, you know, society and, and is ripped apart and people's lives are are so deeply affected and there's physical scars that you see. And and that that intrigued me. And, and um, I came back to London after that trip. And as I say, fairly shortly afterwards, I had the opportunity to go to, to Afghanistan and I jumped at it because it was a combination of this this um, exposure to, to this post-conflict world, but also um, my sister, you know, who had told me all about that extraordinary country. And, and um, so it was a combination of things. So I, I went to Afghanistan. Um, really, I wanted to, to, you know, experience the country and, and report back what I was seeing, because um, I, I, before I went, I learned that it was a, it was like a forgotten war, and that although the Soviets had withdrawn in eighty nine, this was ninety four. Um, actually, the country was in it was it was more at war than it ever was, you know, since. And and yet everyone thought the war was over. The Russians had left. You know, it must be peaceful, and it was a forgotten right. war. So I wanted to I wanted to see that, and I wanted to try and show that and um bring that back and so it was very journalistic i wasn't i wasn't thinking about art i wasn't thinking about um aesthetics so much i was i was really thinking about you know um performing the the the, the work of a journalist and i went with a writer who was a journalist um, and it was for a newspaper so it was very much a a, a photojournalistic trip and so do, do do you see yourself having a transition from that so i mean i'm the i'm the viewer like if i take a look at uh you, you know your book in the the images with with the liza griswold right and you yeah. have um your photography there and both of your collaborations are with you know they contain poetry that's connected to it with the other one with polly jean harvey um is is, is do you feel I, mean, I see your images as poetic? I see as these two things working back and forth between each other. And yeah. in my mind, yeah. uh, it feels deliberate that the language that is being used and connected to your photos, um, it, I think it's important that it is poetry in that the, the land eyes um, in, in kind of short uh, pieces. Is that something that so I'm talking about your images. Did, did you feel yeah. like if words were going to be next to your images, that they would be of that form uh, of a poetic? Well, form? the funny thing is, yeah, the funny thing is, I mean, I, I do the work as poetic, you know, um, I, and, and, and the funny thing is that darkness visible, that book. And, and I think there's probably images. There certainly could be images in, in, um, in the land eye book and also the book with polly the the um the hollow of the hand that were taken on that very first trip in 94. now i was going with a journalistic cap on i wasn't thinking about poetry i wasn't thinking about art but i did get pictures that i see now as being very poetic and i think also the country inspired me you know i, I it was it was a uh, it was incredibly incredibly saturated with color and yet i was shooting black and white uh, on that first trip, mostly I, I did shoot some color, but I was shooting black and white, and I think that probably helped too because because it was it was there was an abstraction to it, um, and I was thinking in black and white. But I you know I I do I, I am very conscious that my work is poetic, um, you know, and and um, and I, I I you know I, I strive for that now. I mean I, I absolutely you know I embrace that. And but that, on that first trip, if you'd asked me like, is your work poetic? I would I would have thought you know no I'm, no I'm I'm being a journalist. But in actual fact, um, I I um, I you know I I did um, I did seem to achieve some kind of poetic imagery, and um, I guess you know I did that, and I look at the work, and and uh, uh, I. I would have come back to London after that Afghan trip, and I would have, you know, gone back to working for newspapers in London. I used to work for a Swedish newspaper as well, and um, you know, poetry was the last thing on my mind. 
Uh, but then the next time I went back to Afghanistan it was 96. And um, I was again being a reporter, but the pictures I got were poetic. You know, it's, it's, um, it's sort of an instinctive thing, I think. Yeah, and they're 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 quite beautiful. I I want to I want to en- engage in a little bit of uh, speculative. I'm maybe making a mistake of um, you know not having seen the piece of art <laughs> that I'm going to talk about. Um, oh, the film, a, a dog, a dog called Money. Oh, okay. and um, but but the, but the question um, the, the question that came to mind, which was really fascinating to me, and I hope you can uh, maybe shed a little light on it. You know, you you're. you're what I've read in the descriptions and seen the trailer and bits and pieces of it is that there's this uh, dynamic that's going on with Polly Jean Harvey and the locations that she is in, in creating um, song and then going into the studio at the same time, you're, you're, you're an artist, you're depicting her connection, um, you know, between those two things. How do you create the art and what environments are creating it? So I see you both kind of, you know, Jo- I imagine both of you like working in in trying to describe that process or depict that process. Um, on your side, uh, what was it like to try to document another artist's process of creation? Well, I wasn't. Uh, I certainly wasn't in the field. Um, you know, when it came to the Somerset House, the recording studio. Which, you know, I should explain also that that was quite an interesting, unique experiment, which was she wanted to create almost like an installation, an art installation. And, and uh, in the in the depths of this big old palace, the Somerset House, which is on the Thames in central London, um, inside a very, very large room, they, they built another another smaller room which had windows. And that, that so that 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 structure was was the recording studio, the area outside that studio was the, the bigger the bigger room and an audience could come in and look through the windows at the process of the recording of the album um, the people inside the musicians and and the producer and the technicians couldn't see the people they couldn't see out it was it was like a one way glass but the people on the outside could see in and they could also hear what was being said because everyone in, in inside the room was wearing a uh, a lapel mic um, so it was it was being um, broadcast outside and so that was something I, I was allowed as the only person uh, inside uh, to film that and shoot that. So in that way, I, I was very consciously sort of recording the process. When I was in the field with Polly, um, I was going about my work and she was doing hers. We were, we were setting out to do two things. One was to, well, three things. One was to eventually, hopefully, have a book of her poetry and my pictures um, the second thing was that she was writing what she was hoping would, was going to become an album. And the third thing I was doing was I was going to try and make a film of the whole collaboration. So I was just getting on with things. It, it was a bit of a struggle at times because on the one hand, I was trying to get good images still and moving. And because I was traveling with her and we're friends and we're both sort of quite private in ways. I didn't want to be kind of asking questions and she wouldn't have been answering questions. She's not that type. So I had to, I had to just go about my work and she went about her work. And then every so often I would film her in these environments, but it wasn't a kind of a very conscious, uh, you know, thing of, I am documenting this person writing her songs. You know, I was, I was just going about my work and actually documenting I did the same thing with the Landai book. I was documenting and photographing what I saw and that would fit into the overall scheme, you know, with with the land eyes, which are which are poems, um, mostly written by women, but certainly they're, they're sometimes written by men. But they're 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 sort of written in the voice of a woman. It's a strange thing, um, but they're always describing women's lives. And and as a photographer in Afghanistan, you know, especially a man photographer, male photographer, you're not supposed to photograph women. I mean, in traditional places. And if you're walking down the street and, you, and you're being seen photographing women, you'll get people, you know, giving you a hard time. Uh, it might might actually become quite dangerous. And it might even also endanger the woman because it might be seen that even though she's not colluding any way, that she might be accused of, of, of you know, looking for this attention from this photographer. Sure. So I sure. never tried to photograph the women for that, 
for that project, I decided that, well, actually, I'm photographing what these women see. They're writing about what they see in their lives. So if I photograph Afghan life, then that's what they're seeing either through their their eyes or through the burqa because some of them are wearing the burqa all the time. So so it, it was it was it was a it was a funny sort of um, um, position to be in. But in the end, I was just I was just going about my work. And I just thought that with with the film and with the books, you know, with editing and with um, layout and with structure, this is how the story will, will be told. And it'll be told in the voice of the woman. So, you know, the land eyes, you're kind of seeing what the world, the Afghan world through the woman's eyes. And I suppose with with um, uh, Hollow of the Hand and um, A Dog Called Money, it is the world seen through all these eyes and my eyes. This is a collaboration. Um, sorry, in, in, in A Dog Called Money, because on one hand, we're looking at Afghanistan, Kosovo, Washington, D.C. We get to know certain characters in those places, their stories, their backgrounds. Then we see Polly sometimes interacting in those places, taking notes, talking to people. Then we hear her notebook that she's written. You know, the, the, I use as a voiceover um, her notes from her notebooks. I, 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 I took out the, the sentences that I thought were kind of meaningful in certain contexts of the film. And it's literally the first thing that she wrote down in her notebooks. So sometimes with a song, she would re-edit that or you know, discard a line, discard a word. What I've got as, as, the, as the voiceover in the film is directly, you know, the first, thing that she, the first, the first draft of, of, of history almost. You know, she's, she's in Afghanistan with me. We're looking at something and she's putting it onto paper. And that's what you're hearing in the film. And then you, then you go into Somerset House and you're, you're part of the audience watching this process. Then at times I, I leave the inside sanctum and I go outside with the crowd and I look in. And I'm seeing what those people see inside. So there's a lot of different, and you know, the film starts with. Sorry, you haven't seen it, but the film starts with with a young boy staring through the the the, with the windshield of the car that we're sitting in, and you're just seeing this very big close up of this boy of about eight eight ten years of age looking straight at us. Um, so there's a lot of things about reflection, observation, um, authorship. Um, experience, witnessing, uh, being conscious of this, um, voyeurism, you know, how we're, how we're voyeurs. I mean, she's got this great song called Dollar Dollar, and it describes how, you know, when you're sit we're sitting in the car in Kabul, and you're at, tra you know, you're, you're, the traffic means you're not moving, and the beggars are out, and this kid was begging, looking through the windscreen, and she she talks about that horrible feeling you have when you're when you're in in that situation where you're trapped. You can't you can't move. You can't really. You can close your eyes. That's about all you can do if you want to escape this 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 gate the gaze of somebody begging. And you know you've been told by people don't pull down the window and give money because it'll it'll create a a crowd of kids will come and it'll be dangerous and and all the rest of it. Um, and that horrible feeling you have, helpless feeling. And she 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 conveys it so well in that song. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a voyeuristic um, aspect to, to, well, all our lives. But you, you, you particularly feel it in, in, in places like Afghanistan, where you are this, you are this outsider. And um, um, so there's lots of emotions going on. Um, so, but, but, you know, that sounds very complicated and sounds uh, um, very deep. Actually, I went and I did my work. <laughs> you know, I got on with the work. You know, the ideas are there. The ideas will, will, will come into the ideas came into play before we even left the, you know, the country to go traveling. But, you know, afterwards you, you, you gather, you gather the, the material and then you start making sense of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very much of the feeling that, um, you know, when I'm working, it's, I'm in another zone and I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, it's, it's, I'm not really thinking too deeply at the time I'm working. Um, afterwards, you know, you almost go into, you go into another, another state, um, and you're gathering, you know, you're gathering and you're, um, and later on you'll make sense of it. Yeah. And I, respect. I really appreciate your, your description of that. And, you know, part of the, the, the question is to, 
uh, you know, to, to really understand that. And, um, you know, I mean, you shared a lot there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the insight to, to the process. One of the things that really struck me, um, with, with your images in say the poetry that was there is that it becomes quite apparent, particularly within the land eyes and in, in other situations, images and poetry that folks, uh, yourself, uh, Polly Jean, other people you collaborate with, the folks who are in a war-torn country are engaging in art that could get them killed. Yes. Um, that, you know, the land eyes are so incisive, so powerful, so short, they capture the reality in, 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 a, in a nutshell. And it, they're amazing pieces, but what is apparent is that, you know, you know, that's death is potentially all around and there's significant risk in creating that art. And, uh, it, that feeling's palpable, uh, in both the images, uh, that, that, that you have in, in the poems themselves is cause I think, you know, even without it being described to you that this is dangerous work. Yeah. And I think it's also the environment, you know, like the, the, the place, the place Afghanistan is, um, it is, it is a, it's, it's a beautiful place and it's, it's, um, the people are extraordinarily hospitable and warm and, and generous, but it is quite dangerous and it's quite, um, it's a tough place. It's a tough life. And in fact, you know, the, 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 um, the tradition and, and the, the, the religion, you know, of, of, the land eyes are it's Pashtun, it's Pashtun, and and the Pashtun culture uh, is very traditional and very fatalistic. I mean, uh, you know, the, these these poems are, you know, they they sort of dismiss death and and um, they 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 make fun of death, and um, it's it's a it's it's uh, it's a hard it's a hard life, you know, that they're describing and. Um, it really, um, it it really, it really comes across, I think, in the work, um, and uh, you know, I mean, I suppose the thing that 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 makes it easier and even possible at times for these women is that, that it's it, it's anonymous, you know, that they they don't put their names to it, um, they don't reveal who who wrote the pieces. Um, and, and that's a, that's a form of protection. I mean, that's another reason, obviously, why I wouldn't be photographing, for example, the, the person who wrote this, this poem, because, um, that would be revealing their, their identity, which, which, which could, could be very dangerous. Um, but, um, I mean, we, we, um, in the making of, um, of, uh, I'm the beggar of the world, uh, there was a group of women who ran a poetry society in, in Kabul, and um, you know, Kabul's a different matter. They're able to walk down the street with their head head covered, but you know, they they're not not wearing burqas. Um, in parts of the, most of the, most of the rest of the country, that would that would not be that would not be possible. Um, but there's a so there's slight slightly more um, more uh, opportunities for 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 that in in Kabul. But they had they ran a, a phone in. Where, where women could r ring in with 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 their poetry, you know, poetry is a huge thing in Afghanistan. And there was a story about this girl who um, was an incredible poet, and she was ringing from Helmand, which is a really remote and um, very traditional and very repressive part of Afghanistan. And um, you know, they would they would um, when she, when she'd ring in, th there was excitement in the in in the, in, the, in the studio with the, this group of women because she was such a great poet. And she would she would be creeping out and borrowing her older sister's phone to make the phone call. And um, meanwhile, her brothers apparently were watching that she wasn't making phone calls to to men. Um, very repressive situation. Anyway, in the end, this girl killed herself. And um, the story the story that 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 we heard was that um, um, she had um, she was being forced to marry um, somebody that she didn't want to marry. Um, but also her poetry was, was, I think it was a problem. They, they found out she was writing poetry, which was seen as a sin. And so it's, it's, it's a really tough world, you know, it's a really tough world. And, um, um, and they write about it, as you say, with such, such frankness and, uh, and humor, but it's very, it's very black humor, you know, it's, it's quite yeah, gallant very, humor. 
Yeah. yeah very, yeah. very dark, dark humor. And in a, like I said, I think there are 20, 22 syllables, if I have it correct. And that's just, right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're just, they're just condensed, which, uh, you know, which I think is an outcropping of, you know, you're not going to have, you know, John Milton <laughs> tomes. <laughs> you're going to, you're no. going to have these, these, these kernels of the, of the truth that they're, um, experiencing. Uh, Seamus, I got a couple uh, more abstract questions, uh, kind sure. of a, a, away from you know the material of your work, and I ask sure. all guests these, and uh, I get some great answers. Um, one of the big two is, um, what is art? Art, I think, is um, it's many things, but it's um, it's life for sure. Um, it's being critical. I think I think uh, you can be, you can be poetic and still be very critical. I think it's it's uh, appreciating um, what's around you. I think it's 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 you know it's shining a light on on the stuff that that makes life worthwhile. Um, it makes you want to jump out of bed in the morning. Um, it makes life civilized. Uh, it makes the winter bearable. I could go on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it makes the winter bearable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I love the variety of answers. Uh, I, I, I get to that because, you know, art is a driver for, for many of my guests, whether it's, you know, overtly creating pieces of art. And I've had, you know, musicians, uh, you know, photographers, painters, yeah. um, hip hop artists uh, within music. Um, and and, and I, I just love hearing uh, what 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 that means uh, for folks. I had mentioned that, you know, I've, I've studied philosophy and, uh, you know, I've studied that question for months, but then that didn't end. I kept kind of looking at that question and wondering, you know, you know, what, what it was. And another yeah. uh, philosophical question, which of course is the, the title of the podcast. And, um, I, I always give the opportunity to kind of uh, answer this question in the context of, you know, creation, when you create something or just in, in general, um, the, the general question, uh, you know, in this world, um, why is there something rather than nothing? Is there nothing? I don't think there's ever nothing. There's always something. I think the main thing is that that something is something that's good. Uh, and I think if you can create something to fill the vacuum, because if you know, if I think if the, if 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 you create something and you you are in control of that something, then that can be something good, you know, um, something beautiful, something interesting. Um, the idea of nothing is, is um, I can't imagine that, actually. I can't yeah. imagine nothing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and, and if, 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 if there was a sort of state of nothingness, then surely the first thing you do is you do something to make something. You know, you, you, you'd do something to, to, to make it the way you want it. And I think that's actually another description of art, isn't it? We, we try to make the world the way we would like it to be. Um, tell stories so that you know people learn things and behave better and um, you know um, make life make life better I mean I think art makes life better yeah yeah Seamus a um, couple more quick ones uh, who uh, you you're around a lot of folks you must encounter a lot of artists who else would you like to hear uh, answer answer these questions My mother, <laughs> she's she's no longer with us, but I'd love to hear what she has to say about about, about these things. Yeah. Um, um, who else? Did your mom love art? She did. She did. Um, you know, she she painted a little bit. Um, she read a lot. Um, I think she. She gave me some kind of um, sense of aesthetic, which I think is 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 you know it's it's apparent in my work. So I think I owe her a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And and finally, um, you know, and this is this is for you. Um, 
uh, is is there anything you can let listeners know about how to you know encounter your art? I know you have a website uh, which contains uh, the videos, including all the videos for Let England Shake and some of your shorter videos. I believe uh, one or two might have been shown on the BBC. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a, yeah, yeah, there's something that was in in um, in the New Yorker. I did a film, short film, a couple of short films for the New Yorker. Actually, one was. One was during the the London Olympics in 2012. They got in touch with me and said, "You know, would you like to do a film on the Olympics? But don't go to the Olympics. Just just do London during the Olympics." So that was an interesting project, um, and um, that's on the New Yorker site. Uh, it's called "Went the Games Well." Um, another film which I did for the New Yorker is called "Home Is Another Place." which is a, f- a short film about um, my return to Dublin uh, on the, f- the, the 50th anniversary of the death of um, JFK. Because I actually saw JFK when he v- visited Dublin, vis- visited Ireland in 1963, a few months before he was assassinated. And so I combined that, that memory of seeing John F. Kennedy in Dublin as a three-year-old boy, first my, must be my first memory, um, with my own return to Ireland, having not lived there for for years, and um, so that's on on the New Yorker site. Yeah, and as you say, on my on my own website, uh, shamusmurphy dot com, s e a m u s murphy dot com. There's films and there's uh, photographs, and then there's the books. Um, A Doctor Is Visible, Afghanistan, um, The Hollow of the Hand, I Am the Beggar of the World and the Republic. Yeah. And it just really, um, beautiful works. And I'm hoping, uh, to, to track down, um, a dog called money. I know it's shown at, uh, and of course that's, you, you, you know, your newer film. Um, I know it's shown at a couple, uh, you know, kind of independent film fests over here, uh, in the United right. States and it's been released. It's getting, it's, yeah. yeah, it's getting a release in, in the UK, um, November the 1st, um, uh, it's, it gets a UK release um, all over the country, and there's a number of venues in in London, and then in Ireland, Republic of Ireland, it, it opens um, later in October, in, in November. Germany, I think, it's got a limited uh, release. It's it's slowly getting there, um, and it's doing some festivals. I mean, I've I've done all the major festivals. I'm off to Vienna tomorrow for the Viennale, and then I go to China in December for a festival in Beijing. Um, and it'll be out then on on DVD Blu-ray, uh, I think in December it, it, it's out on uh, on that release. I, I very much I very much look forward to it, and um, I got to tell you, uh, Seamus, uh, it's 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 really been a thrill to to talk to you, and I I, I deeply appreciate um, your time, you know, uh, spending some time on the podcast with these questions. That oh, uh, my pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. that uh, I I just I I really got a. Uh, I've enjoyed talking to you and I I really love the work and I felt propelled to contact you and I just again the thanks for me but also everybody that'll listen um, just to just to hear uh, you know about about your works and about uh, your process and uh, I really look forward to um, uh, your incredible images and um, in 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 films to come so just really wanted to give you a deep thanks Seamus uh, for spending time You have a great evening, and um, thanks again. You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing.